This is a bonus episode and the last episode of the Death to Tyrants podcast. The crushing weight of the tyrant's passage had left nothing unmarked. You get split in fucking half, but I call him the hologram graph. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmically equivalent of solids, liquid, and gas. We smash a science with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Yes, what's up, you guys? Welcome back once again to the Death to Tyrants podcast. As always, I am your host and humble narrator, Buck. Johnson coming to you out of Lockhart, Texas, where, yeah, this is the last episode of the Death to Tyrants podcast, but you will be getting a new episode dropping this Monday, January 4th, the Counterflow podcast with Buck Johnson, yours truly, of course. So the reason for the name change and the updates to give you guys, Thaddeus Russell, who I am sure that you are all quite familiar with, He has started a podcast media network, and uh, he's bringing me aboard. So that's basically the news and what that will do, obviously. I think I mentioned this on the last episode. I can't remember. My mind has been all over the place this last week because so much has been going on with it and making the the changes necessary. I might have mentioned this. So obviously with Thad, his podcast and his his whole organization, he's got a giant reach. You know, everything he does with Renegade University and the Unregistered Podcast. He's bringing me aboard his media network. And don't freak out. I still get to be me. I get to do whatever I want, do my own thing, interview who I want. But it will give me a giant reach, you know, a lot more people to hear this message that uh, I put out on this show. So that's really the reason it was. he's been nothing but awesome to me. And I'm stoked and and, uh, fortunate that he's willing to do this with me of all people. So that's the news. Monday, January 4th, the Counterflow podcast drops. And so for you guys, you don't need to do anything different. If you already subscribe to Death to Tyrants, it'll be populating in your feed just like this show did every Monday. And so if you don't subscribe, you better go do it. Subscribe right now. It's going to be that same feed. And so uh, we were going to be messing with the website and all of that good stuff. And I will update you guys as things happen. So that's the news. Counterflow with Buck Johnson drops Monday, every Monday, but starting January 4th. As for this episode, the bonus episode, the last episode of Death to Tyrants, I've got my friend Rebecca Dillingham, also known as Dissident Mama. She is here with us. We are going to have a, you're, we had it already. You're going to enjoy this discussion. Rebecca is so cool. She's, well, let me give you her intro and you'll find out who she is, what she does. If you haven't heard her podcast, the Dissident Mama podcast, I urge you to check it out and you will see that a couple of weeks ago, I was a guest on it. And so it's now time for her to be on this one. Rebecca is a truth warrior, Jesus follower, wife, boy mom, and lifelong learner, apologetics practitioner for Orthodox Christianity, the Southern tradition, homeschooling and freedom, Virginian by birth, Carolinian by choice, recovering feminist, socialist, and atheist. How about that? Graduate of the University of Wisconsin-Madison and retired mainstream journalist turned domesticated bell and rabble rousing rhetoric. I hate this word. I don't hate it, Rebecca. I have trouble saying it. Rhetorician. There you go. So she is quite the rabble rouser, no doubt about it. Dissident mama, Rebecca, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm very well. How are you, sir? I'm very well too. I had fun on your show, the Dissident Mama podcast. So I assume this is going to be at least that enjoyable and I get to ask you the questions. So while well, let's just jump right into it. Oh, you know what though? This is yeah. the last Death to Tyrants episode ever. Wow. Yeah. That means I killed the tyrants. This is good. <laughs> you did it. <laughs> We're, we saved Yay. the best for last. So, <laughs> so yeah, the big switch comes right after this episode drops. So this is this is good. Let's introduce you to my listeners who may not yet be familiar with you. So talk about your show and what the life of the dissident mama, Rebecca Dillingham, is all about. 
Uh, well, I launched the blog itself, dissidentmama.net. We uh, have bought .com, but just haven't had the time to figure all that out. But uh, anyway, dissidentmama.net. Launched it in December 2016, so we just celebrated our four-year anniversary. Uh, basically, the gist of me starting it was I do have a degree in journalism, and I'm very opinionated. So uh, I was always you know, annoying people on social media. And I actually stepped back and thought, you know, I think I have interesting things to say. I think I know a lot about things because I've made a lot of mistakes in my life and I'm kind of a political junkie, but I don't want to kind of force this all on people. So if somebody wants to know what I have to say, they can simply go to my website, right? If they like what I say, they can share my links, that kind of thing. So this was all, you know, the 2016 election and, you know, everybody's teeing each other off. And so it was kind of born out of that. However, I had wanted to do it for years, but I have three kids, you know, I had three kids very close together. I had one and then 16 months later I had twins. So, you Mm. know, that was not happening for a very long time. I had other priorities, But Dissident Mama has become a priority because I am doing it for, you know, my progeny. Um, I'm not just doing it because I feel like sitting around researching rabbit holes and all sorts of things like that because um, I'd rather be doing other things, actually. But um, the world's a maddening place, so somebody's got to do it. So that's kind of where I'm at with the podcast and then uh, the—yeah, I'm sorry, with the blog. And then the podcast, um, it was just kind of like— I started a vegetable garden during the quarantine. You know, I started, you know, like getting things off my bucket list. And I just thought, hey, why not do a podcast? And my husband, who's a tech guy, helped me figure all that out. And he encouraged me to do it because actually it was early on during like, the real like low time of um, the quarantine and, you know, everybody's masked and, you know, people are freaking out. Not that much of that has gotten better, but it was a really, you know, it was dark there for a while and I almost gave up on all of it. I'm like, nobody listens. Nobody cares. Everybody's stupid. (laughs) I'm not wasting my time anymore. I'm just going to take more naps and play with my dog more and whatever. And at that point, my husband said, honey, you should continue this and we need to do the podcast and we just need to kind of double down our efforts with this. So he inspired me like he always does because he's the one who actually talked me into launching the blog too because it's a team effort. I mean, you know, right now he and the kids are cleaning the kitchen so I can be here talking to you. Very nice. So that's it. I just did episode 25 the other day. I think it was 25, 24, 25. So I don't put out a lot. I'm shooting for, you know, two or three a month, but I talk to a lot of different kind of people. And that's what I like about my podcast. And I write about a lot of different kinds of things. So it's not just homeschooling and Southern tradition and politics, whatever, you know, it's all of those things because I think all of those things matter. Oh, and I talk a lot about religion as well. And you're in North Carolina, correct? Yes. Okay, cool. Well, one of the fascinating things I've learned getting to know you a little bit is your political journey has been all over the place and talk about, I mean, from where you started to where you are now, you know, you might call that opposite ends of the spectrum, I would say. As you put it to me, it was feminist to atheist to socialist to Protestant neoconservative to libertarian to now paleoconservative orthodox Christian. And obviously, you've seen a, a little bit of a lot of things, I suppose. Uh, when did this journey start? And, and what was the initial appeal of feminism to you? Well, it was all kind of a package deal. You know, I grew up in a family where my, my parents were like Reagan Republicans. You know, my dad would listen to Rush Limbaugh while he was out in the shed, you know, doing woodworking or whatever, you know, in his little man cave. And, you know, I guess... You know, I knew a little bit about politics, but, you know, I was born in 1971, so I'm going to high school in the 80s. You know, we're just having a good time going to keg parties and stuff. So I wasn't really tuned into that. But at that time, I became a hippie. You know, I started seeing the Grateful Dead when I was 15. So, you know, you start being like, oh, I guess I'm an environmentalist and all these kinds of stuff. So I was kind of, you know, bucking my parents, whatever, their Reagan Republicanism back then, but, you know, it wasn't really at the forefront. I was just more concerned with going to see shows and, you know, doing beer bongs or whatever. So (laughs) I went to, um, 
college, uh, it took me quite a while to figure out what I wanted to do. I actually went to five colleges and it took me 10 years to get my bachelor's degree. That's a blog in a podcast all in itself. But when I finally went away to college, I wanted to move kind of far away from home uh, because I had decided I wanted to be a writer and save the world and do all these kinds of things. And I moved to Madison, Wisconsin. I wanted to be far enough away from kind of like my hippie influence friends who are still my friends, but I wanted to be very serious about school too. And I was never a, a, you know, a bad student, but you know, like I was in AP English in high school, but like, you know, the dumb kids math class, whatever. Uh I didn't really care about school because I just didn't, I was just doing other things. So anyway, I decided to be serious and went to the Berkeley of the Midwest. And that was kind of the thing, you know, it was like, these are the truths. These are everything that has ever been kept from you. You now have a beeline to truth. And we're going to tell you exactly how your parents are wrong, how your upbringing was wrong, you know, in our little, you know, community here that, you know, says it believes in, you know, free discussion and stuff like that. And Back then, there probably was a little bit more of it, but I just jumped in, you know, wow, I didn't realize, I guess I am a feminist. Wow, I guess this whole God thing is kind of stupid. I don't know, you know, you know, socialism. Oh, yeah, I want to take care of poor people, all those kinds of things. So I was just a sponge. And so it's kind of hyphenated. I think I have that on my about page, recovering feminist, atheist, socialist, like it's all hyphenated because it was a package deal. You know, so I would say most of my friends fell into that group. I got a minor in women's studies. I think they called it like a certificate back then, but it was the same thing as a minor. So I'm a journalist who wants to save the world, minoring in women's studies, but like half my best friends are guys. Go figure that out. So, you know, I thought I was this man hater, but I really wasn't. And that kind of comes back to, I think, where I am now, because even though, you know, I guess I thought I believed in socialism, I thought I believed in these things, I really would have never thought of censoring someone ever, (laughs) even in my craziest, most radical days. So I think I'm just kind of coming back to maybe some of the things my parents taught me, you know, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, those kinds of things. But, you know, I'm becoming more learned all the time. I would call myself, I guess, a lifelong learner. And so really, I don't really think I understood what I was being taught back then. You know, I just thought it was cool and neat and niche and edgy. And then, you know, I started making decisions based on those things like, you know, my husband was scared to propose to me, right? Because I thought marriage was an (laughs) oppressive institution and all this. So I had to propose to him And he tells me now about all these times he had thought about proposing to me, but he thought I would say no. It's like, why he stuck with me? God only knows, but thank God he did. Um, So I had to propose to him. Um, You know, we waited seven years to have kids, which, you know, looking back now, I'm very much like on the train, like, I want my kids to get married young, have lots of babies, you know, (laughs) just wasted years. I'm like, oh my gosh. So, um, Yeah, I could keep going on about that, but I guess I'll just say 9-11 kind of hastened the whole, wow, you know, maybe I need to rethink things. You know, everybody has kind of their watershed moment. It was 9-11 for me. So that was 2001. You know, I was 31 years old, recently married, you know, started thinking that kind of pushed me into like this whole Bush phase, Neo Connery. But then the longer you stay in that, you start to realize, wow. That's not all it's cracked up to be either. Then went through this libertarian phase and then now I'm a paleocon. I will say that a lot of the people that I'm friends with and I would consider compatriots now call themselves libertarians. So I still, um, you know, uh, I see a lot of alliances that can be made between people like that. However, neocons, you know, the big con, that whole kind of thing is just, I just blogged about that recently. It is something that is not just a sinking ship. Like I want it to sink. I want to put, you know, bowling balls in it and make it sink even quicker than it already is. So, uh, yeah. And then in the midst of all that, I kind of got reconnected to my Southern roots, which also was something I tried to purge back in the nineties in Wisconsin. It was in my women's studies classes, actually, you know, where it was the first time I'd really kind of heard this kind of anti-Southern thing, because even back then that was not very popular. Most people were not saying that. 
Um, the people I knew in Wisconsin thought it was, you know, kitschy and cool that I was from Virginia and my roommate was from Mississippi. They called us the bells and liked when we drank wine because then our draws were really accentuated. You know, they thought it was cool. Yeah. Now, I don't think so. So anyway, that's where I'm at now. Um, I'm sure we can go off on some of those tangents as you ask me more questions. Yeah, yeah, we definitely will. When you were considering yourself a socialist, were you diving into socialist literature, like the classics, I suppose? I guess it would probably be a little bit of the classics, but mostly, I guess it would be like hardcore first, second, and I guess some third wave feminism, which, you know, okay, I guess less so of the third wave feminism, but, you know, a lot of the early feminists were definitely socialists, some outright communists. So it's, it was that kind of thing. Um, you know, victimology, the little guy. I don't think it was probably so much economic. It was more okay, just like bleeding right. heart. Cultural liberalism. type stuff. Okay. Yeah. So you weren't pushing for, you know, the government needs to take over private industry and, and, and control the means of production and that kind of thing? No. And in fact, if you look, I look back to my life and how I was living it, you know, I always had a good work ethic <laughs> and, and, you know, uh, there were always these hippies and, you know, on state street in Madison, like begging for my money. And I'd always tell them like, um, you know, they'd give me some spiel and I'd just tell them, Oh, it sounds like a personal problem. So even back then, <laughs> you know, and I would just walk on a class thinking, right, Heck, you know, right. I'm a bartender and I'm at this 8am class, dude, you know, it's, why are you asking me for money? But I did think probably government was the solution to problems, but sure. I wasn't thinking big, large scale stuff like that at the time. You know, I was still doing a lot of partying. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I feel you. I, I was doing the same in those years. Um, <laughs> let me ask you about the neocon phase. You said that 9-11 kind of tipped you that way. And, and I think that was common for a lot of people where you see the country seemingly attacked by a foreign entity of sorts. And so your thought then was, you know, supporting George Bush and going to war. Is that the kind of neocon-esque phase you're speaking of? Yes, because that's where the 2000 election, you know, I was still a liberal or whatever. And I did not like George Bush, but I did not like Al Gore either, which is interesting. I actually voted for Nader. Okay. <laughs> so even back then, I sort of had some common sense that like, okay, I may call myself a Democrat, but this Al Gore guy is just right. really um, right. beyond the pale. So yeah, by the time, you know, uh, 2001 happens, um, yeah, it was, we've been attacked. Oh my gosh. It was this whole, like, I have to defend and he's the guy, you know, looking back on it now, it's, I mean, it's easy to see why people did that. But on yeah. one hand, you know, it just, you know, the government took advantage of all that, obviously. And, you know, the, the things that were born out of that or, you know, we're still living with it today. But, yeah, it was that whole kind of thing. So by the time four years later, I mean, I am, you know, going to George Bush parties and stuff like that. Oh, you know, wow. I mean, I am okay. unapologetically, yes. you know, going to like, yo, yay, we need to. I, I, my husband and I actually went to some kind of little protest in Raleigh, you know, about how, oh, we got to go into Iraq, you know, to spread freedom and all this kind of mm -hmm. stuff. And like, mm -hmm. it's really crazy to think back that, that that wasn't that long ago. So so what then tipped you to the direction of, I suppose, then it was libertarianism from the neocon phase. Was it the Ron Paul moment? What happened to get you towards liberty? Well, I think it's just because um, I I do like you know, I'm a news junkie. I'm a lifelong learner. So I just started diving into things and then hearing people's names. Oh, let's hear what that guy is. So, you know, I hear about people who were leftists two days ago and now they're, you know, ANCAPs. And I'm like, what? How does that happen? But I mean, for a Gen Xer like me, this thing, this takes like decades, you know? I mean, this these kinds of transitions happen so fast now, but it was a very long process for me. So I just started hearing people's names and I started reading magazines I hadn't read before. And somebody would say, you know, oh, this person that I like, what they had to say, started reading a book. And through that process, this was also the same time my husband and I were like, wow, we should probably have kids. Like, what is this about? Because I'm seven years older than my husband. So I didn't have my first kid till I was 36. Um, we're also, you know, like, wow, this Jesus guy, he's pretty cool too. So all these like light bulbs are going off in our head at the same time. And, um, you know, I can't think of any one thing where I was like, ha ha, 
this is it. Everything I've been told about neoconism is a lie. And this is all, it was a slow, drawn out process, which, you know, I kind of like that it is because now I, I feel like, you know, I'm finally sort of getting on the right path because I have been very slow and I guess tedious to some people, but it's been methodical for me because I've kind of dipped my toe into, you know, almost everything, you know, as far as, you know, ideologies go or whatever. So, uh, and then of course, 2008 Ron Paul, I mean, that was, uh, you know, I mean, it's just going to be the cliche. He was saying stuff nobody else was saying. And yeah. you were just like, wow, I never thought of it that way. I remember, you know, the whole like Giuliani debate thing, you know, where, uh, you know, there's different people on the stage. But when he said that, it actually made me bristle. But mm -hmm. then I thought, he's, he might be right. You know, <laughs> like <laughs> it was so, you know, antithetical to, you know, where I had come from. But, because, I mean, even like as a Democrat, you know, I'm voting for Bill Clinton back in the day. So even like coming from that, like, wow, maybe all this warfare is a, isn't a good thing. I mean, I think he's really the first person I ever, ever heard say that, you know, maybe there's a professor somewhere who said that, but I just don't remember hearing it. And the way he said it, of course, was just so simple. So anyway, um, and then, you know, once you know who Ron Paul is, that's, I mean, I, start, I remember listening to the very first Tom Woods podcast. Oh, okay. And it sounded like he was talking through like a metal pipe. And my husband's like, you know, the, this podcasting was still kind of early when sure. he got into it. Yeah. And my husband's like, you can't listen to this, honey. It sounds like, you know what? And I said, well, it's really good. And I'm sure this guy will get his act together. And it's like, darn it if he didn't do that after all. <laughs> yes, yes. Him and I have the same producer who's oh, okay. going to be listening to this, you know, producing it. So he'll have a big <laughs> smile on his face. But yeah, I guess I've never heard some of those early Tom Woods episodes. I, I can't remember exactly when I discovered Tom as far as the podcasting goes. So were you hearing people like Walter Williams on Rush Limbaugh's show? Because a lot of people kind of got that influence as well. You know, Rush would be out and Walter Williams would come in and Peter Schiff was out there and that world, especially when Ron Paul got a little bit better known, were those voices ones that you would hear and that would influence you as well? Not really, because when my dad was listening to Rush Limbaugh, you know, I was not, you know, he was in his man cave. So, you know, I really got into Walter Williams much later. Okay. Uh, Peter Schiff, I only know about him or knew about him, discovered him through that first Tom Woods. And I don't know how I listened to that very first Tom Woods, because it was like, I think he... I think it was like the day it came out or something. Somebody told me about it. I should really figure that out. But, you know, I listened to those, you know, very early on. And then, you know, that opened so many um, avenues for me because he interviews such different kinds of people. Yeah. But it's one of those things, you know, he'll have a guest who will talk about five different people. So you go read their articles, you, you know, listen to their audio book, read their book, read excerpts, book reviews. I mean, it's just one of those things that... uh yeah, I it's don't know. My yeah. husband has a better memory than me, but I, I think it was just kind of Ron Paul and then the Tom Woods world was opened up to me. Okay, and at that point, you would consider yourself, you know, I'm a full-fledged libertarian? Yeah, I mean, I guess so. Uh, you know, probably 08, 09 to yeah. 10, probably. Yeah. And then I guess, gosh, riding that rail for quite a while. Were you reading any of the classics in that sense, in the libertarian world, Murray Rothbard or anyone in that vein, Hans Hermann Hoppe? Yeah, I was going to say, you know, I mean, the Mises Institute is yeah. so, so valuable Yes, because you can get all that Rothbard stuff on there for free. For free. You, know? you guys so. listening, all of that stuff's available at the Mises Institute for free. You have no excuse for not free. to be reading it. Yes. So you were discovering those writings as well? Yes. I will tell you, I never really had a Randian phase, though, because when I was coming to libertarianism, I was also becoming a Christian and her whole objectivism thing yeah. just kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Um, you know, so, I mean, I know, you know, I, I, I just really didn't have that phase. So, uh, you know, when everybody says libertarianism, they're all just about Ayn Rand. I mean, that just was never even a thing for me. Yeah. Um. So yes, reading all that kind of stuff. And then later on, you know, 
Hans Herman Hoppel, what is up? He spells Herman with like two N's and he's got a hyphen in there. And how the heck do you say his last name? And like, who are these people? But yeah, um, yeah, I would say, um, gosh, what is his um, democracy? The, the God, God that, that failed. failed. Yes. Is that the name of it? Uh-huh. Yeah. That is a radical book. Yes. And um, I guess he calls himself a paleo libertarian, yes. but I mean, you know, he's talking about monarchy and stuff in there. And, you know, it's, I like it. Yeah, me too. <laughs> the mutual obligation, um, you know, I think that's something that some libertarians, you know, we talked about this a little bit on your show that uh, they miss out on, you know, that that I think some kinds of monarchy do get. Yeah. Whatever the Habsburgs or whatever, I guess, was one of his big examples. But um, yeah, so, you know, I won't say I'm the most well-read and have read every Murray Rothbard sure. book, but, you know, I read a lot of articles, a lot of... Um, you know, books and book reviews, listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, yeah, and I just like learning, yeah. What are your thoughts on libertarianism today? And I mean, from your perspective today, not just libertarianism as it stands in 2020, but I know there's, you know, a lot of us have some issues with libertarianism incorporated, we can call it, right. big libertarianism, the blue check, the blue pilled, type libertarians. What's your thoughts on, from your perspective right now, on libertarianism today? Well, libertarianism just as a label, you know, it's just such a big tent kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you call yourself a libertarian, but I think we share a lot of the same uh, principles. Um, a lot of Mercer would be like that too. She calls herself a paleo libertarian. You know, Tom Woods, um, you know, he's just Mr. Libertarian guy. And, but he also believes in kind of the, you know, family faith uh, that, you know, maybe, um, you know, kind of the, ho the Hoppian thing, like, mm -hmm. you know, borders mm -hmm. uh, can be good, you mm -hmm. know, because they can protect your, your people over here doing their thing that they want protected, their private property and their principles and how they live. They want it to be protected. So, you know, you know, Jeff Dice said blood and soil, you know, that got him in all trouble. But I think what he was trying to say was not to freak people out and have people call him Hitler, but he was just saying that libertarianism is just a philosophy. Yes. You know, you can't live your entire existence on that. There has to be more to life. And if that's your philosophy, that's great. You know, that's how you want to live every part of your life. But I think that's fleeting. Um, so you know, and then uh, if you look back at some of the very older roots of libertarianism, you know, there's an argument to be made that it was left wing in the beginning. So yeah. it would be like, you know, maybe people who have these beliefs that, you know, roots and tradition and maybe hierarchy of the family, uh, traditional gender roles, things like that, maybe they're not really libertarians. Who knows? Maybe there's something else. Maybe they're not what I am. I guess you you have to give yourself a label. Paleocon is what I've chosen just because, you know, I tend to agree with the people who call themselves that. I think Paul Gottfried coined the term and I'm like, okay, I guess that's me. But, you know, I'm more than that. You know, I'm a Christian. I'm a mother. I'm a wife. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm all these things. So, you know, they're just labels to kind of help you figure it out. But I will say, you know, the whole after Charlottesville, you know, the, the, the LP people trying to say you have to sign this disclaimer to say you're, you know, not a racist and all these kinds of things and just these virtue signals and you have to believe this to be a libertarian. And it's like, no, you don't. Mm -hmm. So I got really annoyed during that whole post Charlottesville phase because I almost went to Charlottesville. I know people who went to Charlottesville, you know, the fact that we have to hear that, you know, it was a deadly white, white supremacist rally all the time, not just in the New York Times, but like when Reason Magazine's talking about it too. I mean, that's yeah. ludicrous. So um, I just got really burnt out and, you know, I don't know, just kept kind of kept doing my thing. But it's interesting because I would call myself probably more a Southern traditionalist now than I ever have in my whole life. And I think it's through Tom Woods that I discovered the Abbeville Institute. And the Abbeville Institute is, I mean, 
just one of the greatest things ever, in my opinion. I'm very good friends with Dr. Livingston. He is a wonderful human. I mean, he is my mentor, but he's my friend. I mean, he is a wonderful human. So everything they do, I think is just top notch. So, uh, you know, those things matter to me. And, um, you know, a lot of people within libertarianism would want to say, oh, you know, your flag is just sky cloth, you know, as their little icon is black and yellow, you know, like, well, you have your little colors there. I want my battle flag, you know, what's the damn difference? So, (laughs) you know, they want to be like these completely, you know, high and mighty people, but they all have their identities. They all define themselves too. And I'm like, why don't you do your weird thing over there? And I'll do my normal thing over here and let's just (laughs) leave each other alone. (laughs) <laughs> well, let's talk about you do have a lot of pride in your Southern heritage and Southern history and Southern traditions. There must have at some point obviously been kind of a, a renewed spark with that kind of thing. And you because you said that some of the universities try to put a little bit of a, you know, tamp down on some of that type of stuff. What kind of renewed that energy for you? And why do you feel that as such a big part of you? Well, it's interesting, you know, going to school in Richmond, Virginia, which is where I grew up, you know, I, we had a pretty good history education. You know, it was like, oh, it was about states' rights. It was about economics. Slavery was part of that. You know, um, it, it was nuanced, you know. I mean, it really was. And I, I mean, I just went to public schools, but it, it was uh, it was pretty good, you know. Uh, but then you walk away from that and, you know, nobody's reinforcing this and, you're just so easily duped once you stop thinking about it. But I really never learned, like, really, really. I mean, were they fight? Oh, okay, they're fighting for a way of life. But what was their way of life? What were they really believing? What was the ramification of the agrarian life going away? What was the ramification of um, centralization? You know, I mean, I was in high school. I wasn't thinking about these big picture things. <laughs> so that's what tapping into that was. And then I started realizing, wow, I mean, if I'm against big government, I must be for decentralization. Mm-hmm. Wow. So secession is so much more than, you know, the the the, the comic book version that, you know, everybody says it, says it is just slavery, slavery, slavery. You know, all these things, you know, these Calhoun quotes, you know, what is he talking about? You know, when He says these things that today seem white supremacists. I mean, it's like reading the Bible. You got to look at the context of the time. You know, why was it a big deal for Jesus to talk to the woman at the well? You know, that was a big deal because she was alone. That meant probably she wasn't like a high caliber kind of lady. So that whole story means something uh, more than just, oh, he's having a conversation with a chick at a well. No, I mean, to look at the context of what they said and why they said it and what they were opposing even well before the 1860s. I mean, it was just like, you know, taking the layers off this onion and it's like, wow, it's such this rich rich history. And then to see the people who fought against it, like, you know, Robert Louis uh, Dabney and, you know, the agrarians, you know, the Vanderbilt, the Vanderbilt crew and the writings they had, you know, just these prophetic things that we're living through every day, uh, yeah, it's it's just amazing. And then on top of that, knowing that I have blood that fought the federal army, you know, and got murdered by them, some of them, I'm like, where are my reparations? So, you know, that's kind of where I'm at with that. <laughs> well, obviously, some of that type of, of talk, unfortunately, can lead to lefties and people that just, you know, they don't understand much of it at all but they hear it and it triggers them and they are going to want to have you silenced to say the least and you know it's probably worse than that but uh, you had mentioned to me offline before that you have been doxed Mm -hmm. and for those listening that aren't familiar with that term it's basically where someone tries to put your personal information your address and your job and all of this kind of stuff out for the world to see in hopes that you know, they can silence your opinions. Tell me about that moment. Who did it? Why they do it? And what came of all of that? So this was, uh, I think it was about March. Okay, so I have my blog, right? You know, and I contribute things sometimes to Abbeville, but I also contribute to Identity Dixie, okay? IdentityDixie.com. They got doxxed by the SPLC the summer before, 
right? So and tell people what S- that is really quick. The Southern Poverty Law Center. You know, it sounds, I would say it sounds kind of like a nice thing, but really it doesn't. It's right. stupid. Yeah. Their headquarters are in Montgomery, Alabama. But what they do, you know, they they focus on um outing people hate groups, right? You know, it's mostly people they call white supremacists with a big concentration on neo-confederates, you know, and just for good measure, they have a couple of like black nationalists listed on the like hate watch list. But, you know, these people don't get hassled. So it's just a way to, you know, shut up like uh, anyone who has basically Southern pride or maybe thinks that, um, you know, whatever BLM isn't the greatest thing since sliced bread. So it's just a, a tool that is used to silence people, but they get quoted by the New York Times. You know, they're always like, um, it's always either like the SPLC and the ADL says this, the Anti-Defamation League, and if they say it, it's gospel. So mm-hmm. if they don't like you, you know, your life can be ruined. You know, you can at least not be um, acceptable and you know, normal society anymore, whether or not you lose your job. So anyway, they're kind of my compatriots. Um, anyway, I had, um, you know, I, they cross publish my stuff. Sometimes I've had one of their guys on my podcast, whatever. We have a friendship, a working relationship. And I think generally speaking, they're good guys, but, uh, they, after that SPLC thing, I think there was a Twitter, Twitter account called identify Dixie created. And it looked, I mean, identity Dixie identify, I mean, you know, it's like one letter different, I think. And their little logo of this identify Dixie, these, you know, doxing people who are so great, their logo looks almost just like it. So it's really weird. It's like they just target them and people who are associated with them because I guess they're just riding that and that SPLC wave. So they're just trying to demolish anybody, you know, guilt by association, anybody who has had anything to do with them. And this was when the reopen movements were kind of big and a friend of mine runs one here locally and um, I had her on. So I think they were trying to kill two birds with one mm-hmm. stone. Yeah. This is when they were trying to say that the reopen movements were white supremacists. Do you remember that? No. Why that would shock me I, is beyond yeah. me. Yeah, of course, that's what they said. I didn't even know that. that that's, yeah. They love using you know white supremacy and racism as a thing. So why not consider anyone who would like to just earn a living and open their business racist as well? Yeah, that was a thing back in March. And like I said, my uh, friend runs the one here locally. You know, she's just a smart homeschool mom. You know, I mean, she's just a wonderful human, but they, you know, they can't, they wanted to shut those down. And what's the easiest way to do that? You know, yep. call somebody a Nazi or whatever. Yep. Well, I'd had her on my show for like the third or fourth episode. And I think they just saw, I, I think they discovered me looking at her, honestly. Or maybe they found me through Identity Dixie. I'm not sure. But I think they were like, wow, this girl has been flying under the radar. And she is a racist and a neo-confederate. That's what they called me because I had to go back and look. And um, she is in cahoots with this girl who runs this reopen movement and see, you know, just, you know, they're the same kind of people. They're the same ilk and they're haters, yada, yada, whatever. Um, But the woman who doxed me, who said I had just been hiding under the radar and here she was, she was going to reveal me to, to the world. Her name is Megan Squire and she is a quote unquote online hate expert. She's some kind of, um, um, like tech person. And, you know, I think she just combs the internet. I don't know. She teaches at Elon University, which is like a stone's throw from my house. So after I got doxxed, I was kind of freaked out <laughs> because I'm like, she teaches like the next county over from me. I don't know if like she's going to send weirdos to my house. They're going to throw brick sumo in it. I mean, I had no idea. So, um, yeah, she is not a nice person. And I went to her Twitter page today, her little icon, or what, I guess it's a profile pic. I get all the lingo confused, but it used to be her, you know, at um, Lenin's tomb in Moscow, which I've uh, been to Lenin's tomb, you know, yeah. I mean, and I'm not a communist, but she was very proud to be there. Let me just say, Certainly. I was just like, wow, you know, there's Lenin, that's weird. And then we moved on, you know. Uh, but so she used to have that as her profile pic, but she is just, She's not a nice person. So anyway, I was going to write a whole thing about it and tell the world I've been doxxed and this was horrible and, you know, whatever. I don't I don't even remember what I was going to say, but I got Dr. Livingston's advice and some of my friends who are on the SPLC hate list, <laughs> old timers like Boyd Cathy and stuff, who's like the greatest human ever. I wrote them and I said, this is what I've written. 
what should I do? And they all said, just ignore it. You only give them power yeah. if you talk about it. So this is the first time I've ever really talked about it and mentioned the, the chick's name. But um, I just quietly added my real name to my about page because I had had been using a pseudonym, but I always knew I was going to it was going to come out because I wasn't super careful about it, which actually kept me in check because I'm like, one day people are going to know that it's me and I want every damn word I write to be something that I, you know, am proud of. So I think I've done that, you know, and like, you know, my priest knew about it, you know, important people to me, my homeschool co-op knew about it, you know, it wasn't like some big secret. I was living an alternative life. They were just like, oh, there's Rebecca. And, you know, she has some radical little blog, whatever. Cool. You know, it just wasn't a big deal. So anyway, I just quietly added my name to my about pages if it had always been there and she can sit and spin because I don't care. So there have really been no ramifications other than I did think people were going to come throw a brick through my window or kill my dog or something for probably two or three weeks. And then I'm like, oh, well, I guess they're not coming. What's up, guys? I would like to tell you about a wonderful small company that reached out to me to sponsor this show because they love the content. That company is Paloma Verde CBD and Organics. It is owned by two great people, Carlos and Vanessa Abalar, in my old town of San Antonio. They are libertarians and Honestly, the COVID lockdown was a bit of a blow to their brick and mortar location. But Carlos has assured me they are tough and will soldier on with business from people like my listeners. That is you guys. They will power on. I trust that for sure. Go check out their website at palomaverdestore.com where you can find things like their amazing melatonin CBD gummies if you'd like to sleep a little bit better. You can find the sports cream if you've got achy muscles. I know you guys work out constantly and they've even got CBD skin salve. Of course, they have the CBD extract tinctures for daily use. They have gummies for all occasions, including strictly vegan ones, if that is your thing. You guys know the great anti-inflammatory benefits of CBD. And by the way, all of their products over at Paloma Verde are THC free. They've even got the studies on their website to show exactly that. And so check this out. I told you they're great people. They want to support my show. Here's what they're going to do for you guys. When you use promo code BUCK, B-U-C-K, you will get 25% off of any purchase over $75. You will also get 10% off of your first purchase when you sign up for their emails. So add that up. 25% plus 10% will give you a total of 35% off of your first purchase. You want to support a small libertarian owned business and support my show at the same time and get a great product that you will love, go to palomaverdestore.com and use promo code BUCK, B-U-C-K. That is palomaverdestore.com, promo code BUCK. I've been attacked a couple of times online and I do notice there's these attempts to freak you out initially, like you know, what's this person capable of? And then I've noticed now, since it's happened multiple times, I think they just quickly forget about you. Yeah. And it almost, it almost kind of insults me like, wait, I thought you, do you not hate me anymore? Like, what, am I right. milk toast now? But uh, I think they move on to the next horror in their life and trying to mess up someone else's life. And I don't think a lot of them work particularly hard in general. So it's kind of like a quick threat. I'll freak this person out. And then next, you know, and they, I think, Hopefully over the time, it seems like they do forget about you. What was the lady's name one more time out of curiosity, just in case my listeners are wondering? Megan Squire. Okay. Might have to look yeah, her up. Yeah, I actually, early on, I was like, well, damn it, I'm a journalist. I'm going to drive to Elon University and I'm going to yeah. take my son with me and he's going to take a camera, you know, my phone or whatever. Yeah. And I'm going to go confront her and just put on my journalist hat and ask her some questions right there. But my husband's like, please don't do that, honey. And I said, like, okay. <laughs> Dang. He's like, just ignore her. I was, but you know, yes. once you know, I'm like, you're threatening my family. You know, Mama Bear comes out. That's I wanted right. to like kick some butt, but <laughs> I got advice from all the right people, so it worked out. Well, I got to ask you, people with unique political perspectives like yourself, what is this Trump moment? The last four years, you know, I say moment. It's been four years now. What has this meant in your mind politically to? I guess where we're at right now, the country as a whole, what have you 
learned from this Trump moment over the last four years? Well, initially, you know, I started my blog in December 2016. So I was having a lot of debates with, you know, conservatives and homeschool moms and Christians who, you know, oh, he's so horrible. (laughs) And, you know, oh, he's disrespecting the office. And, you know, I just wanted to grab them and shake them and be like, you don't understand. He is pissing off all the right people, you know? (laughs) And at that point, I'm like, and he wants to build a wall. And I'm like, I'm all for that. I mean, I'm very much like, we got to control (laughs) <laughs> what's going on in this country with the numbers, whatever that that could we could touch on that a little bit. But like he is challenging the media of which I used to be a part. You know, I used to work in normal media, and he needs to confront these people. And none of these people deserve respect. None. None of these politicians. None. You know, he called it the, um, you know, the the swamp. You know, we know it's the deep state. I'm like he is challenging all the people who need to be challenged. I don't care if he paid off, a, a, what it was she, a porn star, hooker, I don't even know. I don't care. You know, I honestly don't care. And the fact it took some rich New Yorker, you know, not some cool Southern person to do this, you know, says a lot too. You know, he had balls of steel and everybody that hated him, I did not like. And that's what I was trying to wake people up. Now, most of those people that could not understand that four years ago, absolutely understand it now. And I'm telling you, I didn't lose friendships over it, but they didn't talk to me for a while, you know, where we just have small talk passing each other at homeschool co-op or at church or something. But I think they understand it now because, um, you know, I mean, I do not like some of the things Trump did, but I think he did try on some things. And I think that's where we're at four years later, that this whole federal, you know, nationalization of everything politics from the top down, I mean, it honestly showed the president doesn't have that much power. Mm -hmm. So, which is kind of a good thing too, but, you know, we expect these people to go in and, you know, fix everything. Um, I think it's just exposed that this is just a big fat mess, a huge mess. And, you know, before even the fraudulent election and all this kind of stuff. So people are questioning electoral politics. Could, what would all these super conservative homeschool moms always say to me? What's the most important election? Or, well, we have to win at the ballot box. And, you know, oh, well, you have to vote for Tom Tillis because he's a Republican and he'll support Trump doing X, Y, Z. And I'm like, I don't think so. I mean, I think people, again, maybe not at the critical mass that I want, but I think that I have seen in my personal life, people that were just appalled and disgusted by Trump four years ago. I know for a fact they voted for him this time. And that means something because it means that they are waking up to the fact that most of the stuff we call America is just a big sham. You know, it's all smoke and mirrors. So, you know, I'll take what I can get. And of course, COVID didn't help with that, you know, because a lot of these people I know are small business owners and stuff. And you know, a lot of these people are a part of that white supremacist reopen movement I was telling you about, you know. <laughs> yeah. So they're starting to see, wow, maybe Rebecca isn't as radical as we thought. Maybe we should have been reading Dissident Mama for the last four years. That's what I always tell them. I said, I blogged about this three years ago. Yeah, yeah. Why, did, why are you now getting this? Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Just tell them, welcome to the fold. It's about time you catch up. <laughs> That's right. So in the 90s, there was kind of a a moment where a lot of the entities that you and I both appreciate kind of met. And that was the Mises Institute with uh, Chronicles Magazine types and Paul Gottfried types. And uh, Ron Paul, Lou Rockwell, Murray Rothbard ended up endorsing, or at least, I I guess so, endorsing uh, Pat Buchanan. And it was called the Paleo uh, Libertarian Alliance. Mm -hmm. And there is, I don't know that if you know this or not, but maybe I'm dropping another secret there is going to be a push for this again in 2021. So I would like your opinion, if there is a possibility, which there is, of some old right slash paleo conservatives slash right-leaning libertarians to kind of ally together and say Mises Institute, the Charlemagne Institute, Abbeville Institute, these type of organizations, if there is kind of uh, an alliance and some some stuff to be uh, gained from that. Do you think, what would you think of that first? And do you think the 
let's say, conservative movement, we can call it, or Trump voters or the right-leaning Americans? Do you think this country is ready for something like that? Do you think there's enough red-pilled people on the right to kind of go, you know what, maybe there is kind of a, I guess we can call it an alliance. I don't want to call it a reformation of, but a, a shift in where things have been. But I certainly think Trump did a lot for the right you know, side of America because there, the feeling for anti-intervention is a lot more than it used to be, certainly in the Republican Party. What would you think of an alliance part two, paleo, old right, libertarian alliance part two? And what would you think the uh, overall feeling from right-leaning Americans would be for that kind of coalition? I guess I would say hallelujah. However, <laughs> dot, 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 what, what is the goal? Are they trying to take over the Republican Party at the federal level? Are they talking about getting things going small to where federal law won't matter because if local politics is taken over by awesome paleo libertarian slash paleo con people, it won't matter. Like that would be my question because I don't know, just the whole federal politics thing, it's just so messed up and so (laughs) evil. I would want to know. Now, these people are way smarter than me, so I'm sure they've thought about this because Tom Fleming was part of that original thing, right? Mm -hmm. Thomas Fleming? Yes. Yeah. um, You know, if Thomas Fleming and and, um, Lou Rockwell can get together on stuff, who I consider both of them two of the smartest people around, learned people, but also very realistic um, and not wanting to bend and conform and concede and apologize because those days need to be damn done. We need to stop playing on the defensive and give a huge disclaimer about all these things we're not and we're sad for. No, you have to take the offensive. So if they're doing that, and I have a feeling that, um, and I don't know if Thomas Fleming is part of this new thing, but I would guess he is because he's still on fire. Um, Yeah, whatever they want to do, I would probably be a fan of, but also I don't see that as a problem at all because, you know, so let's take Brian McClanahan, right? You know, yeah. he um, helps run Abbeville Institute. Well, you know, he also is on um, Tom Woods's Liberty Classroom. You know, there's yeah. like a bridge to be built right there. That is already there in existence. Like I said, I think I found out about Abbeville from Tom Woods. Um, you know, I know um, yeah, when I've been to an Abbeville Institute conference, I've been to, I think, three or four of them. I went to a secession conference. Well, who spoke at it? Um Jeff Deist yeah. of the Mises Institute, yeah. uh, Michael Bolden of the Tenth Amendment Center. You know, Michael Bolden used to be a freaking communist. So yeah. you know, now he's like friends with everybody, you know. Um, yeah, I don't see that as a problem at all. But I think you have to be very, very careful about infiltrators and subversives. That's all because that's always what happens. You know, even like you take the Tea Party, you know, a, a lot of people say that was Astro from the beginning. I don't think it was because I think it was just people really, you know, angry about something and wanting to stand against it. But it got, it did get taken over. It got co-opted so quickly. Mm-hmm. But these people, again, smarter than me and have been around and burned before. They've all been burned before by neocons and leftists and all sorts of things. So, um, this makes me look forward to 2021. You had kind of mentioned it, I think, off air before. Uh, I was guessing it was something like that. But uh, I'll tell you, the the Southern traditionalists I know, you know, the the hardcore paleocons, you know, I'm talking like Clyde Wilson, mm-hmm. you know, again, Dr. Livingston. You know, these people have been fighting this fight for so long, and they're never going to give up, ever. <laughs> so... You know, we may as well just build alliances. And I, you know, I want this bridge building to happen. My most recent thing was like Southern traditionalists need to ally with the Groypers, you know, the Nick Fuentes people, mm-hmm. because they say a lot of stuff that's right. You don't have to agree with everything they say, but they have momentum because they're young. And also, you know, I think Nick Fuentes, he used to not, he used to kind of make fun of the South and stuff. I think he's realizing that making fun of the South is part of the game. You know, it's part of the big centralization game. You know, you demonize Southern guy and you can do almost anything because everything is built off of that. Mm -hmm. I call it the archetype. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's something too, you know, I don't know if they would want the Groypers in, but I'm just saying that 
you know, there's a lot of people out there that are ready and have been wanting this for shoot. You know, I was in high school when they were being rebels. So yeah, yeah, I'm ready yeah. for it. And I've only been at this for a few years. What are your thoughts on secession as far as the future of where we're at now? I mean, obviously, we both appreciate the the spirit of it years and years ago. But do you see it as something that could happen in our lifetime? And let me let me add this caveat. Is it the best way forward? Well, it would be messy and hard and difficult. You know, somebody, uh, I saw it on a thread the other day, uh, where, you know, this was a pro-secessionist thread, but it's like, what would you do with, you know, Social Security with people in your area that depended on that, you know? Whether or not you think that's a good idea, they are depending on Social Security. That's a whole different argument. But there would be people in your little community that depended on that. Um, Yeah, I mean, military bases, figuring all that kind of stuff out. uh, It would be sloppy and hard. So, um, But I think it's preferable to what we have now. Um, I think it could, all those things could be figured out. And I think they are preferable to true civil war, which is, you know, peaceful secession is the way to go. But that's the thing, you know, the, the, the Leviathan does not want us to leave. You know, they, they, they need their producers. They need people fighting their wars. They, they need us, you know, I mean, California, you know, Cal exit, you know, I don't love California, but the guy who runs the Cal exit movement, you know, I think they're the sixth largest economy in the world, you know, the state of California. So that would have, and they have tons of military bases. Mm -hmm. They do grow a lot of our food. You know, how would all these things be figured out? Um, I think they could be, and it's preferable to, like I said, civil war, but it may not come until things get worse. And, you know, sometimes I think I'm living in a dystopian nightmare, but, (laughs) you know, we're still pretty comfortable. So it may take something insane, you know, more insane than 2020. I don't right, know. Right. But um, I will tell you, you know, I went to that secession conference in November 2018. Mm-hmm. And people I know, you know, my normie friends who are smart and wonderful, but, you know, they were like, secession? He, he, he. Oh, Rebecca, she's so cute with her weird ideas. I mean, now <laughs> yes. they're like, wow, tell us about secession. I mean, that was not that long ago, two years ago, and people thought I was a nut job. Yeah. And now secession is on everybody's lips, you know, whatever. Uh, Rush Limbaugh talked about yeah. it and what's his name? Just whatever. Even, you know, neocons are talking about it. I think yeah. David French mentioned it, uh, you know, but the neocons are the ones who have equated secession with neo-confederacy for the last 20 years. So sure. now they've painted themselves into a corner. Thanks, fellas. So I, I don't know. Um, I want it to happen and it may just come when we least expect it or yeah. it may, I mean, it could be my grandkids are dealing with it. You know, I, I really don't know, but I am for decentralization and breaking up this blob because, you know, people in Portland, Oregon don't care about me. And honestly, you know, I don't ish, wish them ill, but I honestly don't care about them either. Just sure. let them do their weird Portland, Oregon thing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. If only they would let you do your weird North Carolina thing. Right. All right. At the end of your episode with me, we got to talk about music. So mm-hmm. let's let's uh, lighten it up here and talk about that with you. Okay. You got to be, well, you have an interesting history in music in general. I know your Grateful Dead history. It's crazy. I cannot believe you. I think you said you've been to over 90 shows. I think I'll, I... I think it was 89. God. I never, I wanted to make it to 100, but, you know, I stopped at 89. I actually stopped seeing them, I think about a year before Jerry Garcia died, just because the shows were kind of torturous, man. You know, The Dead was always kind of like, oh, every third show is awesome, but you got to see two really like flaked out shows to get that third one that, you know, <gasps> takes you to heaven and, oh, you know, it's so euphoric, you know, so if you go on tour or whatever, you know, I'd sometimes see like eight shows in a summer or whatever, you know, some of them weren't the greatest. They did have ebbs and flows. They had different periods of time where they were nailing more shows than others. But I mean, I stopped seeing them before and I started seeing fish a lot. (laughs) So um, yeah, I never got to 90. Um, I think it was 89. Yeah. And I I started seeing them when I was 15. So, I mean, I was seeing, 
you know, whatever the math is, quite a few every tour. And they toured spring, summer, and fall. So if you're catching four to five every tour, you know, it adds up. Yeah, well, the money must add up. I, I've never actually spoken with someone like this that has done that. A friend of mine has done it with Pearl Jam, but it was it was a much lesser extent than, not, I mean, 89 shows is incredible. I, I, You know, someone asked me, you know, what band have you seen the most? And it was a buddy of mine that I had seen the most. And I guess I've seen him, I don't know, I would think 30 at the absolute most. 89 is incredible. Yeah. I've never asked someone this because I've never met someone that's gotten to do all of this. <laughs> do do you make friends? Is, is it almost like when you go see, if you have season tickets at a, a football stadium, do you see some of the same people and you're like, hey, good to see you again. And you kind of meet up. Is it like a community? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I grew up in Richmond and most of my friends were, you know, deadheads, but we had a crew in Raleigh and we called it like the Richmond Raleigh Connection. And, you know, we would meet each other at shows. And of course, they're bringing friends into the fold. We're bringing friends into the fold. You know, people are moving around and doing all this stuff. So it's like, you know, it's kind of like the tribe, you know, they back then, you know, hippies would be like, yeah, it's our tribe, man. You know, so you're, you're making all these connections, but, uh, you know, <laughs> I was driving from Virginia to see the dead in Deer Creek, which is in Indiana. This was like, I don't know, 90 or 91. And we met people at a rest stop who were lost. This was before GPS. And we said, hey, well, we're going to Deer Creek. Just follow us. I ended up being friends with those people for years and years and years and years after that because we met them at a rest stop like in West Virginia. They were really lost. They were from Worcester, Massachusetts. They were really lost. They followed us there, but we were friends forever. So weird things like that would happen. I mean, I guess the same things would happen with like your rockabilly scene. You know, you just start making friends. Yeah, you see no people doubt. on the way to the show. Yeah, you know, yeah. you're at the restaurants near the venue. You know, yeah. people are hanging out. Somebody starts dating that guy. You yeah. know, that guy's cousin. You know, it just starts growing. But it really, I mean, it was a massive scene, you know, after they had their top 40 hit when I was in high school, I think yes. it was like 87 when Touch of Grey was out. Mm -hmm. But uh, it still was kind of small because you would recognize the people, you know, you definitely would. And you were a music journalist as well. How did that come about? And I assume at that point, did you get to, you know, chat with any people you, you know, kind of considered heroes or influential musicians in your life? So it's interesting. So, you know, I had always liked writing, but I never thought about a career in writing. I just, whatever, like I said, I was partying, I was doing other things, wasn't thinking about it. And it, you know, I'd gone to all these colleges and dropped out and I finally said, well, wow, maybe I shouldn't be in college. You know, it took me a lot of money and wasted time to, just because back then everybody went to college. So I wish somebody had just been like, stop going to college, Rebecca, this is not working out for you. But anyway, I had to figure it out on my own. And um, during that time, you know, I was seeing fish a lot. And, you know, I just fell in love with them and thought they were the greatest. And I was like, I must tell the world about Fish because they're the greatest band ever. And this was before they really made it big. Like the first time I saw Fish, like I think the ticket was like five bucks, you know. So they were still pretty small at the time. And um, <laughs> and I started writing for a magazine called Unbroken Chain. It was a um, Grateful Dead thing that actually my sister's high school friend started, you know, she did it all on her own, but she made a little money and whatever. Long story short, I started writing, I was like their fish correspondent. And anyway, I ended up moving to Wisconsin and um, I got a job at some of Madison's, um, it was called Night Sights and Sounds at first, and then it was called um, Maximum Inc. Uh, but it was the local little music magazine. So if anybody came through Madison and everybody goes through Madison because it's a college town. So if anybody came through Madison, we would interview them. And so I ended up, you know, working for both of those magazines. And then after uh, I graduated college, I got a job at the Colorado Springs Gazette in their entertainment department. So I got to go see shows for free at Red Rocks. It was awesome. Um, and yeah, I got to, I was thinking about it today. I had to ask my husband, I was like, who did I interview? Oh my gosh. I can remember a handful of people. Like I interviewed um, Larry Lalonde from Primus, John Modeski from um, Modeski, Martin and Wood, um, Mike Gordon from Fish, Aaron Tippin, you know, because, you know, you'd have to get like the big country acts yeah, who, sure. who came through the town. I think I interviewed Ani DeFranco, but then on the same hand, I'm like, 
I don't remember any of the questions because I used to be a huge Johnny DeFranco fan in my feminist days. Uh Um, So whatever. (laughs) Anybody who was anybody in the 90s, you know, Meat Puppets, whatever, Cypress Hill, you Mm -hmm. know, uh, chances are I probably talked to at least their bass player. (laughs) Wow, very cool. (laughs) Yeah. Well, tell my listeners about where they can find you online, find your blog, get the podcast, your Twitter, any of that. Plug away anything you need to. Okay, it's uh, dissidentmama.net. You can um, get the podcast through there, but, you know, I do it through Libsyn, so I'm sure you can get it on iTunes. I think you can get it on Spotify, whatever. Mm-hmm. It's it's available wherever all the cool kids are. Um, uh, I do I have a YouTube channel, so if you ever want to see me talking to my guests, I'm trying to make that a thing because I think that's really engaging to actually see the people talking. Um, I have like 50 subscribers there. You can get me up to 100. It'll be awesome. Um, and then, of course, I'm on all the whatever, Facebook. Let's see, what I'm what am I not on? Now, let's say I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Parler, MeWe, and Gab. And if you search Dissident Mom on any of those, I'm sure I'll come up. Excellent. Well, thank you for being here on the very last episode ever of Death to Tyrants podcast. Thank you, Rebecca. Well, that's an honor. Thank you so much. Yes. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed that fun discussion with Dissident Mama, Rebecca Dillingham. And thank you for always being loyal to Death to Tyrants. I've been doing this since January 2017. How about that? Is that right? Let me look real quick. I say that. Uh, let's look. I should know, right? It's my show. Just 2017. January 2018. Excuse me. I'm not that old yet. But uh, yeah, I've loved it and I'm thankful for the new friends and and listeners that I've gotten to know. And I'm thankful for one Thaddeus Russell to bring me aboard his network and give me a bigger reach, bigger audience and still do what I do. Pretty good stuff. Hope you guys have a wonderful new year and I will see you on January 4th with the Counterflow Podcast. You get split in fucking half because I call him the hologram graph but I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid and gas. We smash a sinus with the power of Lord Titus but I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Like the sound of the Death to Tyrants podcast? Our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.